Welcome to the Cutting Edge Health Preventing Cognitive Decline podcast. I'm Jane Rogers. And before we get to our guest, you hear people say you need to take control of your own health. But how do you do that with a mountain of medical information that's changing constantly? This podcast might point you in the right direction, but then there are the major hurdles of implementation. My team and I have listened when you ask for personal help in applying the ideas from our podcast experts. So here's what we've started. Monthly Zooms with a longevity-focused MD or me. Think of this as a time to ask your questions and get answers to speed your progress. Also, do you want the inside skinny on sourcing key molecules, dosing to consider, and learning what's working for us personally? To further guide you, my team and I have put together an extensive online video course called Cutting Edge Health Accelerator. We want to accelerate the implementation of these paradigm-shifting scientific breakthroughs in your life. Both these come together in one package to make it easy to slow aging, be sharper, live longer, look better, and have more energy at mycuttingedgehealth.com. You can find out how to get this personal step-by-step help to get you through the maze of choices and out the other side living a healthy and longer life. Again, mycuttingedgehealth.com. Use the code JANE10 at checkout to get 10% off. Our way of saying thank you for being a listener. And now on to the podcast. How do you go about reversing memory loss in its early stages? Dr. Kat Toops is a functional medicine psychiatrist in the Bay Area. She's now running the second clinical trial of the Bredesen Protocol to help restore cognitive function. From her background, she's convinced there is not a one-pill solution for Alzheimer's disease. So I would like to welcome to this podcast just a wonderful researcher. Her name is Dr. Kat Toops. And you may have heard me talk about her before because, Kat, I've just been such a fan of yours for what you have done with helping people with mild cognitive impairment. Deep bow to you. Thank you. My pleasure. It's my passion. I love to help people. So (laughs) it's great that we're finally getting these tools to really move the needle on something like dementia. Yeah. So for someone who doesn't recognize your name right away in this field, Can you tell people just briefly what you did with the Dr. Dale Bredesen protocol and the study that you completed and then where you are headed now with now a larger cohort? Okay, well, let me back up just a tiny bit. Um, I'm a psychiatrist by training and a geriatric psychiatrist, and I've also been a researcher throughout my 30 some odd years of my career. Um, Who's counting at this point? (laughs) But um, I I used to run a clinical trials research center, and I have been the principal investigator on over 100 clinical trials, and I did quite a few trials with um, Alzheimer's and um, definitely saw several in MCI. In the older days, MCI was a newer construct than it is now, Um, and all of those trials failed. I, I, I did over 20 trials for Alzheimer's, and I did trials with all the drugs, the older drugs now that are out there with the Aricept and Namenda mm-hmm. and things like that. And when I say failed, they might have had some improvement um, or the delay. Really, it's, it's not that people improve, but it's a, it delays mm-hmm. the decline. So they're not really getting better. And, and even back then when I, when I was still doing clinical trials, pharmaceutical trials, um, we did have anti-amyloid drugs that could wipe out all the amyloid plaques in the brain. And the, the thinking is still a pervasive thinking in the pharmaceutical industry. Well, if the amyloid is causing the problems, let's wipe it out and people will be better. And that seemed like a reasonable thought, but it doesn't turn out to be true. So even some years ago, we had drugs that could we could show on the PET scans that, that the amyloid plaques were reducing, but people did not get better clinically. And that's all that matters, right? We need to be better clinically. Yeah. So, um, yeah. you know, fast forward or not not fast forward, but um, while I'm doing Alzheimer trials, I suddenly started becoming very cognitively impaired myself. And I was 50 years old and I had become allergic to everything. I had, you know, what I later learned was multiple chemical sensitivity and my immune system was going crazy and my brain didn't work. And I would test my patients for the cognitive testing 
mm-hmm. using three words that I had used for more than 20 years, and I could no longer remember those words. And I would have to write it down, and I, things just they got oh worse gosh. and worse. And I, I, you know, I had to stop working. I had to move my trials to another research center. Um, I couldn't use a computer anymore. I couldn't back up or parallel park my car. I couldn't decode what was being said. I thought I needed hearing aids and I really had an auditory processing problem that I had developed. So my brain was degenerating very rapidly. And I had the good fortune to learn about functional medicine. And I, you know, immediately saw the utility of this whole, and we, you know, Dr. Bredesen likes to call it precision medicine, but it's similar. The idea is root cause resolution, right? What are the causes that are, you know, contributing to factors like our brains degenerating? So I immediately, you know, with a sieve for a brain, because I wasn't retaining anything and I wasn't comprehending in the same way I used to, I, uh, I you know, went through all the modules in, in functional medicine and I applied each each facet to myself and I gradually got better and I got my brain to come back online. And so then uh, and started practicing functional medicine, oh, helping other people fabulous. with, you know, both psychiatric and, and, um, and cognitive disorders and then had the good fortune to meet Dr. Bredesen early on. And uh, now we've been working together for quite a few years on the research. So, sorry, that's a little long segue into the research that we've done. And um, so uh, we had a clinical trial with 25 patients at three locations. I worked with Dr. Anne Hathaway and Dr. Deb Gordon. So we were all collaborators on this research study with Dr. Bredesen. And the exciting news from our study is it was a nine-month trial. Everybody had an active Um, functional medicine, precision medicine treatment, which is different for every person. You know, it's people say, well, what did you do? Well, that's kind of a long story when you look at individually what we did, because, um, you know, we need to figure out what what are the factors for each person. And we can definitely talk more about all those factors. But um, the upshot of the study is that 84% of our patients had improvement. And when you think of comparing to now we have these newer um, anti-amyloid drugs that are coming out on the market, nobody gets better in those studies. And the latest one that has the best statistics that just came out, um, it slows the decline by four to seven months, which is not much, right? I mean, in the scheme of things, if you think of, you know, uh, when somebody's diagnosed with Alzheimer's, for many people, it's about a 10 year process from diagnosis to death you know, as the brain degenerates. And so, okay, mm-hmm. you, if you get, say you're at the top of that range, you have seven months of, you know, slowing, but you don't get better. I don't see much utility in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, and of course there's huge risks with those medications. There's, you know, I think it's up to 24% of people have brain bleeds from the medication. So as it's clearing the amyloid plaques and the way the mechanism works somehow in it's disruptive to the blood vessels in the brain and people have bleeds. And in, you know, several of the trials, I think the last two different drugs, three people died in each of the trials from the brain bleeds. So there's a high risk with those drugs for very little payoff. Um, so it's, it's very exciting for the work that mm-hmm. we do. And, and look, let me just first off say, can everybody get better? Uh, we're not ready to say that. I'm not ready to say that. But, you know, if we look at the numbers and we look at the statistics, we had 84% of people that had some or a lot of improvement. I mean, some of my patients went from mild Alzheimer's to completely normal. Wow. And so this is lasting. This isn't something that just lasts for a couple months. You are, you're fixing them. And as long as they continue to pay attention to their trigger points, their issues, and we'll talk about some of the issues that, that you see most common, right. commonly, but as long as they pay attention to those, you're saying this is a lasting brain fix. And, but you made a really important point. As long as they continue to work on the program of what's helped them to get better. I, I see this happen sometimes with cancer. People change things. They get treatment with the cancer. They say, I'm cured of my cancer. Now I can go back to eating my, you know, high sugar diet and, you know, not getting enough sleep and, you know, and their cancer comes back. No surprise, right? It's the terrain. It's the environment. And mm-hmm. it, if you, you know, go back to what you did before that caused the problem, it's going to come back. 
So we've definitely had people more than 10 years out. I'm more than 10 years out. Um, uh, let's see, it was 14 years ago that I had to stop working for three years. And what I find, and I believe Jane in hearing some of your story, I think you found this as well with your own work um, on yourself, my brain gets better and better. It's, you know, because I'm constantly doing things yes. to improve it. And so, you know, when I look at where my brain was five years ago, and actually I, I can tell you more about NeuroQuant uh, MRI scans, and we can actually, you know, see things like the gray matter percentages in the brain that can show that the, that the, the brain is improving its connections. So, yes, it's a really good point. And I, I had one patient, I, I, I I warn him that he's going to run out of his nine lives. You know, I don't know how many lives it is, but he was treated um, with this method with one of my friends in Florida, who's also one of the investigators in our upcoming study. Actually, our, it's not upcoming. It's finally launched. Uh, but um, he, this guy got better. And then he moved from Florida to California and he kind of stopped doing everything in his program. I mean, he did some of it, but he really regressed again. He, he fell off the map cognitively. So, you know, I went through everything, got him, you know, back on what he needed. He got better again. And then COVID hit and he, you know, didn't have the wherewithal to keep everything up and he crashed again. And then we got him back on the program. He got, but you know, if you can't keep stopping and then expect wow. you're going to get fully back to where you were is what I think. Yeah. And when you were saying improvement, you were telling me before we started, when we were just chatting about the MOCA scores. Yeah. And you went back and looked at the data from that first study about how how high the leap was in MOCA. Can you first of all define MOCA? Yeah. And then to tell folks about the improvement. Yeah. So MOCA stands for Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And it's a, it's a typical rating scale done both in clinical practice and in research. Um, it's a 30 point uh, test scale and people are given scores that indicate their level of cognitive impairment. In the old days and in more advanced dementia, we use the many mental status exam, um, but the MOCA is uh, designed to be more sensitive for uh, mild cognitive impairment, which is you know, considered a prodromal or, you know, earlier phase of Alzheimer's. It won't, everybody with MCI doesn't always go on to Alzheimer's. And that's where we can, of course, you know, make a difference when people are just starting to have symptoms. We have the best chance to turn that ship around, right, and get them back on track. But um, the, so the, the levels of the MOCA, mm -hmm. they're uh, in general, 26 to 30 is considered fairly normal. And then, um, 19 to 25, no, let's see, 26, got to remember these things, 26, um, yeah, so at, at below 26, you're getting into mild cognitive impairment. And then when you, when you get down in the, mm -hmm. you know, 19 to 20 range, you're getting into mild Alzheimer's. And, um, and so we had a range of, of uh, numbers and people say, well, what is your average MOCA improvement? So I think, let me see, look, let me look at my notes on that. But the average MOCA improvement of all of our patients was, um, let's see, I think it was about, let's see, nine, yes, um, it was about four, four points in our study. And, uh, and so the thing is, when you separate that out into, when you start at a really high score, like we took people of MOCAs of 26 and 27, if they were at that range, they also had to have impairment on a neuropsychiatric battery called CNS vital signs that we use for testing. Um, so they had, to, they had to have impairments in three different tests that we did in order to qualify for the study. But if you're already starting at a high MOCA, you don't have much room to go up. You may clinically get better, which we saw, right. but you don't have statistically that much room to go up. But when I looked at the lower MOCA patients, so the people in the 19 to 22, which is really getting, that's mild Alzheimer's. And um, there were nine patients that we had out of the 25 that were in that range. And they had on average a 5.3 point, uh, 5.3 points increase. So if you're 19 and you go to 24, 24 is a solid MCI. You're going from That's mild big. Alzheimer's to MCI. Um, but 
But even that doesn't tell the whole story because I had several patients in that 19 to 20 range that finished up with 29s and 30s. I mean, I feel like they would test better than I do. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, it was just super exciting for us to do this. You know, it was our first sort of proof of concept trial we didn't have a control arm you know we were just first trying to say let's look at these people mm -hmm. you know prospectively let's you know get the same data on everyone and what happens so now we mm -hmm. are um, just we've just launched our our next study and um, we have a wonderful funder um, we're funded by a, a single private donor with a nonprofit, um, and um, she calls her corporation um, the Evan Thea Four Winds Foundation. And um, so we're very grateful to our donor for sticking with us all these years. And so um, she's given us funding to do a bigger study. We're going to have 72 patients enrolled at six different locations. So we have now locations around the country and we're going to have, it's, it's considered a randomized trial. So people will be randomized to either the active treatment with mm -hmm. the precision medicine approach or to just receive standard neurologic treatment. And, and so we've looked up the protocols of what do they do at okay. Mayo? What do they do at Columbia? What does a neurologist do? You know, and, and these days, you know, people have, you know, now recognized, oh, let's check the B12 level, let's check the vitamin D. So that's considered standard neurologic care. Um, you know, but a lot of people in the traditional community say, oh, taking supplements doesn't do anything. It doesn't help. Um, and I can tell you from seeing many times of people stopping and starting what a huge difference it makes when you're taking supplements targeted to what your body needs. Um, and then, um, so we're calling that treatment group and it's kind of heartbreaking that we can't give everybody the active treatment in the beginning, but we're calling them the delayed treatment group because at at the end of the nine month trial, the people that complete that arm um, will be eligible to have six months of active treatment and they'll get the same active treatment that our um, active study cohort does. So um, that includes health coach, a nutritionist, an exercise coach. So a lot of support to make the changes that we're asking them to do. What I would like to learn Dr. Troops is if someone wants to be in this new study, what are the cities that they need to live near and what are some of the things ah, you're looking for yes. in, a, in a good candidate? Right. No, that's a, that's a great question. So we do require that people live within one hour of the six locations okay. because there's a lot of back and forth involved in testing and, and um, we need them in our geographic area. People have offered to fly back and forth. Mm -hmm. That's not going to work. It's that it's too labor intensive for that. So our six locations are there's three in Northern California, um, one in San Rafael okay. in Marin County. That's Dr. Ann Hathaway. I moving over. I am in the Walnut Creek area, just north of uh, Berkeley, Oakland. And then um, our other site is east of Sacramento in the El Dorado Hills. So close to Sacramento. Okay. That's Dr. Christine Burke. And then we have Cleveland, Ohio, Dr. Nate Bergman. We have Dr. David Hasse in Nashville, Tennessee, and Dr. Craig Tanio in Southeast Florida. He's in Hollywood, Florida, which is just north of Boca, which is just north of Miami. Okay. So kind of all of that corridor. And if people are interested, it's a pretty easy website to go on and um, look at it and fill out the forms. Um, it's DementiaReversalTrial.com. That's easy. Good. And you're looking for someone who uh, is in the mild stages, very mild stages, not, not deeply into Alzheimer's at this point. Yes. They don't have to have a diagnosis, but mild cognitive impairment or early dementia. So mm -hmm. within that, that range, we're taking MOCAs of 18 to 26. And, um, but we need people that have not yet made any major changes because we need to be able to capture the changes. So, you know, I suspect many of your listeners are already, you know, they've made a lot of changes in their diet and their lifestyle and their nutrients and things like that. So somebody that's already instituted those changes won't qualify. Okay. doesn't mean you shouldn't go on and, and you know, do this kind of work. But for the study, we want to get people that haven't made any changes because we're trying to compare to the people that do standard care. Do they do the same as people that do our 
our, you know, procedures and protocols or do our, do our people do better, which of course we already know that they, they do. do. So there are a lot, what are some of the things, a lot of things that you're looking at? And from the last trial that you ran, what are some of the, the things you're finding most common amongst people who are having cognitive decline that you are able to help them with? And then how do, how do you help them with those things? And so I think you're talking about what kind of findings contribute to cognitive decline. And, uh, you know, Dr. Bredesen started out talking about 36 holes in the roof. And if you, you know, fixed 35 of them and you didn't fix the last one, you're still going to have a leaky roof. And now we have way more holes than 36 that we look at. But, um, you know, I think some of the stuff many people are already well aware of that you need for general health, right? It's, you know, your diet, what are you eating? What kind of nutrients? Are you getting enough sleep every night? What are your stress levels like? So the, those are just foundational things, you know, that, that of course we look at and, and um, you know, beyond that, and even looking at the levels of um, the blood sugar, you know, we uh, diabetes has been called type three dementia, but we know blood sugar destroys not only the blood vessels, but the neurons. So, you know, looking at blood sugar control, looking at lipid control, that's destroying the blood vessels if you have hyperlipidemia and, um, you know, that's a big contributor to vascular forms of dementia. But one, the things that I like to stress that I feel like people are missing beyond those foundational things are, um, the effect of infections, mm. of toxins, and lack of hormones. I think those are areas that not everybody is aware of. And so maybe we can say a little bit about those. If you I like. would love to. Like toxic metals? Is that what you are thinking? It could be metals and it could be chemical toxins. Okay. They're both a big issue. Um, you know, the, the world has just become so toxic that – we all have to really try harder to limit our exposures. But I feel like even, you know, there's some people that will do complicated detox protocols with IV chelation and the like. I don't think that's necessary for most people, but I think we have to approach detoxification as something we need to do on a daily basis mm -hmm. um, for starters. I mean, you know, we have to look at everything we put in our bodies, everything we put on our bodies, the chemicals we use in our homes. And, some people are better detoxifiers than others. So some people, their genetics, they can get exposed to toxins and their body takes care of it. And other people, their genetic sorting makes them not detoxify things as well. I had a patient early on that came to me. She was already in an assisted living facility with moderate dementia and she fairly rapidly was moved to the memory care. So she was, you know, going down and I tested everything I could to, you know, look at what was going on for her and how could we stop this. And she was such an interesting case. She did have some cardiovascular risk factors. Um, but the biggest thing, and, you know, it's never just one thing for people. Right. It's a bunch of things. But in her, she really did have one big thing. When I tested her levels of chemical toxins, um, at that time we were using the Great Plain Labs uh tox test tox and right now they're they're not doing it they've stopped doing it and they said they were recalibrating machines but it's been eight or nine months and so we don't know if that test is going to come back but so we we we're using the real-time labs in our next study for that they stepped up to the plate um, but and the tox test and this lady's panel if you have uh one thing in the red or two things in the red that's considered really significant but she had nine, was it nine or 11 things in the red. I mean, just almost every chemical was just off the charts in the red. Ooh. And, and so it's very interesting, you know, so then what do you think? What is her environmental exposure, right? You, if somebody worked in a chemical plant, if somebody was in an agricultural area where they're spraying all kinds of chemicals on the fields, you know, there, there are certain people that have high exposure to these chemicals. Well, guess what she did? She was a school teacher. She didn't have she didn't any have high levels of toxic exposures. <laughs> no. And her daughter said, you know, my mom and my parents were always health conscious. We ate, you know, clean food. We, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of exposure. So what does that tell me? She doesn't detoxify well. Her genetic makeup means that she just accumulated everything that she got. And so uh, her daughter was in her 50s. And I said to her daughter, you know, think we better get you tested on this 
yeah. you know, and see how your toxic load looks, yeah. right? And and it turned out her daughter also had you know pretty high levels of toxins. So so uh, it can be the chemical toxins, it can be the heavy metals, both mercury and lead, or you know known major factors with neurodegeneration and um, and the mercury. It's interesting. I, I found quite a few people in my study with high mercury levels. I always test for it, and most of that mercury is coming from seafood mm -hmm. and what you know how polluted the oceans have become and and when it's from that source it's not again it's not super hard to clean this up um, i would take people off of all seafood for you know a period of you know usually four to six months i would give them a little liver support to help detoxify further i like sulforaphane so i really like a, a Avmacol is a product that I like. It's a really nice sulforaphane product. And I can see very high levels of mercury come down to zero in six months. So it didn't need fancy chelation to get that down. Mm -hmm. But you can be assured if you leave your mercury levels high, it's known to eat up the brain. Uh, the, the saying mad as a hatter came from the hatters mm -hmm. in the old days that would make hats from felt and the way they made the felt involved, you know, processing the fabric with mercury and they all became, quote, mad. You know, they they had neurodegeneration from that mercury exposure. So um, so that's what I mean by toxins. It can be metals. It can be chemicals mm -hmm. and they can be lurking all over your own household. Mm -hmm. They can. So, um, you know, I think, you know, de detox is a daily thing. We also uh, recommend using a lot of um, sauna and sweating. Um, there's definitely nice data showing that we can mobilize through the sweat. We can mobilize chemicals and metals. And, you know, with the caveat that I tell people, if you're you know, doing a sauna, you're doing hot yoga, you want to wipe the sweat off while it's coming out because you don't want it to reabsorb. You're just you're getting those chemicals out and then you need to get them off and then you need to go jump in the shower and get some soap and wash them off. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, we've also seen that as an effective adjunct. So if people are higher on the chemical burden, then I would be encouraging them to add the sauna in as well. And there's nice data on the benefits of sauna for dementia. Um, I know, uh, let's see, Dr. Rhonda Patrick has done some great podcasts mm -hmm. about this, um, and, you know, highlighting the studies done out of Finland and, and they compared men in, in Finland, historically, it's kind of part of the culture to do daily saunas. And, you know, the, they compared the men who did daily saunas had a dramatically lower risk of dementia. And they compared them to the three time a week sauna, their risk was higher. And then the once a week, their risk was higher. So it, it's, you know, quite, quite a, a major mm -hmm improvement that people can get just by incorporating the regular sweating in their lives you mentioned so you, that was one of the things you mentioned um, the, the tox the infections mm -hmm. and the hormones mm -hmm. you also mentioned the sulforaphane what was that product again ala ala a l oh avmacol a v a v a v m Avmacol, A V M A C O L. Okay, wow. And I like them because they've done a lot of research, and uh, and I, um, they they've done some research even in autism mm -hmm. and schizophrenia, mm -hmm. and showed benefits. There's some, some talks you can find about their product on YouTube with one of the child psychiatrists that did the autism studies, and so I, I do like companies that do research. Yeah. You know, they're investing the money to show that their product works and. I started using that for brain fog from mycotoxins. Mm -hmm. um, I learned about it from uh, originally from Dr. Sh uh, Sharon uh, Hausman Cohen, who mm -hmm. runs Intellex DNA, which has fantastic, you know, um, DNA panels. And she might be interesting for you to interview because mm -hmm. she really has taught me a lot about the modifiers genetically um, within Alzheimer's. But um, she mentioned that the Avmacol product had been so helpful for her patients with mold and mycotoxin exposure because you get a lot of brain fog. And now we all, the whole world knows after COVID what brain fog is, yeah. right? Because COVID likes to go after the brain and many people now are experiencing this, you know, brain fog. And um, she said it was super helpful for that. And, and I have to tell you a little story. So when I learned about it, I got some to try out and my assistant in my office got some to try out and I went away for almost a week to give a talk 
and I came back and my assistant looked totally different. And, and I said, Oh my God, what's going on? You look fantastic. And he said, he got a big smile and he said, it's the asthma call. And he had been treated for both Lyme disease and for mycotoxins. And it basically slowed down his brain processing. Very smart guy. You know, it wasn't his IQ. It was his processing from what was happening to his brain. And after a week on the asthma call, his brain was just clicking like I could see it uh, dramatically. So we became, both of us became big fans of asthma call at great. that point. They have an interesting um, protocol that they recommend um, for some people that are in need of more detoxification. The standard dose is, is for an adult is two a day mm -hmm. of their regular strength asthma call. Um, but, but if you really need to clear out stuff, um, they recommend going up to eight a day. So they say start at two, the next day go to three, next day go to four, just mm -hmm. bump it up as fast as you feel like you can tolerate it up to eight a day. And they're, they're kind of little, they're not this big, they're little small pellet. Mm -hmm. um, they're not tiny pellets, but they're small. They're, they're not as big as capsules. So it's not that hard to pop a few. And then they recommend taking eight from like two to four weeks and that kind of, you know, gauge if somebody really needs a lot, I tell them, maybe you should stay on this for a month. And then you gradually taper yourself back down to the two a day as a, as a maintenance dose. So my assistant, and he was, he's a uh, very tall and um, thin and lean, but you know, he's a big, big enough guy. He ended up going to 10 a day. He said that he just felt better at that dose and he stayed there for a while and then tapered back down but so anyway i have to that's an interesting story it's a n of one you know but it was so dramatic that i've been a fan of that part and i have a lot of colleagues that use it and also feel like it's helpful um because when the brain is foggy it's because things are gumming up yeah. all our biochemistry and physiology and causing inflammation in our brain so the sulforaphanes definitely they they, they say that uh, this product um i think it upregulates. 200 phase two liver detox enzymes. We have all kinds of different enzymes that our liver is using to support us. So this really helps to upregulate those and make them work better. Thank you for that tip. That's wonderful because mycotoxins and Lyme are both things that I, I'm recovering from. And I, I try to take sulforaphanes, but I didn't have a great product. So thank you. Um, tell me about hormones. Is it okay for, oh, when, what if a woman's already well past menopause? Is it oh, still okay to start? The simple answer from all the research that, uh, you know, I'm in a study group with Dr. Bredesen and these other investigators and, you know, a key, key group of us that have been, you know, working with brain research and treatment for a long time. And we've looked at so many studies on the hormones. Um, the problem with our hormone studies, if we, so for starters, and, you know, unless there's immediate risk of breast cancer, um, current breast cancer, um, you know, for most people, it's safe, you know, uh, it, it seems safe and well tolerated at any age to start the hormones. But if you just look at the studies, that's not what it's going to tell you, mm -hmm. because the studies that, that, are, that are still being thrown out there were done with um, a combination, but for the most part, were done with synthetic hormones, the old Primarin and Provera, the pregnant horses urine um, that they make Primarin from, and, and it's oral estrogen. And we know that when you take oral estrogen, it goes through first pass metabolism in the liver and it creates metabolites that cause cancer. And, and you know, and, um, and so the real caveat is you don't want to take oral estrogen. You want to take it through your skin because it's absorbed directly and it doesn't have to go through that breakdown into the liver. Mm -hmm. So um, more and more studies are coming out with the bioidenticals. I think they've been around 20 years now or something. And, and bioidentical hormones, uh, they're regular prescriptions and they're generic. You know, we use estrogen patches for a majority of women and and there's a whole bunch of generic estrogen patches. So it's, you know, they're accessible from a medication standpoint. Though I would say we've been learning that not all patches are equal. And sometimes a woman will be on one brand of patch and her pharmacy will switch to another brand and her levels will fall off the curve. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, you know, that's, that's another thing to be aware of. If you change brands, you need to recheck your, your levels. Um, but 
um, the, 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 there's just such interesting data about the hormones. Um, Stanford did a study. It's now been maybe five, six years, maybe probably longer than that. Time goes by faster these days. Uh, but they took women that were high risk for Alzheimer's that had been on hormones mm -hmm. and they randomized them either to stay on the hormones or stop them. And they followed them for two years and they did, you know, cognitive testing and they did head scans. And what they found at the end of those two years is that 100% of the women who stopped their hormones had cognitive decline and they could see it on the head scans. Ooh. Ooh. And so, okay, can we say that, you know, taking the hormones directly prevented that? Well, I think there's, you know, you can't exactly say that, you know, the, the way, but it's pretty darn compelling. Um, and, and this is what we see clinically. You know, we see when women lose their hormones, their brain suffers. So our brain is full of receptors for estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, pregnenolone. Both men and women have all of these receptors in the brain that are thought of as sex hormones, but they're not just sex hormones. You have estrogen receptors all over your body, certainly in your bones, in your you know, blood vessels, and so when we go through menopause, um, before menopause, women have less heart disease than men. But after they go through menopause, it starts rapidly approaching the risk levels of men because we lose the estrogen protection. Same thing with the bones. Uh, you know, the estrogen keeps our, our bones well. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I think it's really a travesty that many people wait until they've completed menopause to start saying, oh, maybe I should go on hormones. Well, you've lost a bunch of years where your hormones were declining, declining, declining. And then I watched the osteopenia go up and up and up. And um, so the hormones are protective for, for many things in our body, but especially our brains. And when we start the hormones and somebody that's been off of them uh, or, or at any age, even when people need them, um, some people don't notice much and other people have major awakenings of their brain. One of the thing I like to say, there was just a thread on one of the physician community groups um, on Facebook and a doctor was saying she, um, she was going through menopause and she was having a lot of word finding difficulty and she couldn't find the right words for things and she was saying the wrong word. And, and it was correct that, you know, other people on the thread said, oh, this is menopause, right? Yes, we see that at menopause all the time. Well, that happened to me when I was, you know, going through uh, near the end of menopause or even before, and I was having a lot of word finding difficulty. And I went to my doctor, like many of us do, and I say, something's wrong. I'm, you know, I can't figure out what I want to say. And I'm normally pretty good at saying what I want to say. And she said, oh, welcome to perimenopause. This is typical of perimenopause. So I said, oh, this is menopause. And I felt comforted for about 10 minutes. And then I got home and I was thinking about it. And I go, wait a minute. Okay, as women, 50% of us are going to get Alzheimer's, right? You or me, and you and I are both, uh, you know, <laughs> on that road before. Um, and maybe those of us that are symptomatic with the decline in hormones, maybe we're going to have more risk than other people. Um, when I was first put on hormones, uh, they were helpful, but back then the World Health Organization came out of the WHO, oh, yeah, WHI, the Women's Health Initiative study, big study looking at the risks of hormones. And that's one, the one that used primarily synthetic hormones. And it said, these hormones are going to cause cancer. So like everyone else, I stopped my hormones back then. It said, this study that I didn't know enough to read carefully said, these are going to cause cancer for me. Um, and so, you know, I, I lost some valuable years there. And so I do think it's important for women to understand the role of the hormones in the brain. And it's... Um, you know, the, there's the bioidenticals are safe and ineffective. You wouldn't want to use estrogen if you have breast cancer because most breast cancers are sensitive to estrogen. And so if you're taking estrogen, you're going to feed that breast cancer. So, of course, we want to have a clear mammogram. Sometimes people need ultrasounds. Sometimes occasionally people need MRIs. You want to make sure there's no cancer in there before you give estrogen. But if you don't have a cancer, um, 
some of the studies are showing interesting studies showing that after women have had breast cancer, if you give them hormone replacement after the cancer is all gone, that there seems to be less risk of recurrence. Oh, really? Because the hormones help the breast tissue to stay healthy. So when we lose our estrogen, the breast shrinks and it atrophies and, you know, it's not, it's not healthy. Our breasts are meant to be, you know, plump and round and, you know, that that's a healthy tissue. So without the estrogen, the breasts shrink up and they're missing the, you know, what they need. They're, the mm-hmm. hormones are trophic. They're life-giving. They, they give our body what we need. And, you know, many people tell me, well, you know, if God wanted us to have hormones, we, we would keep, we would have kept them, right? But we've kind of cheated evolution in the last century mm-hmm. until a century ago. We didn't live much past evolution. I mean, past menopause or, or andropause in men. And evolution is designed only to see us through our reproductive years. That's all it cares about. And the whole the concept of evolution is, you know, to pass on our genes. Um, and after that, doesn't doesn't matter. But we can live half our life after menopause these days. So that's a lot of years without your hormones. And interestingly, the hormones are so important to the brain that the brain makes hormones. So we think of typically the sex hormones coming from the ovaries and from the testicles. Um, but it turns out that our brain makes its own supply of estrogen and it makes its own supply of progesterone. And so the problem is that we can disrupt the brain making those things by the effects of toxins and infections and mycotoxins and stress and depression, anything that, you know, is inflaming our brain can disrupt the hormonal, the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, and even to the gonads. So um, it, anything that disrupts the brain is going to mm-hmm. disrupt the, the production of the, the brain hormones. So anyway, I, I've just, I'm a, a huge believer. We use them safely, I think, and cautiously. I see too many of my patients go to gynecologists. They, they might be put on hormones, but they don't measure the levels. So how do you know, is that enough for that patient? Is that level too high for that patient? Um, I don't think we need to have patients on these super physiologic levels. Uh, I do know some so I, I have a friend that I respect the heck out of that um, is a you know brilliant integrative gynecologist, and she's taught me a lot of things, especially about these effects of estrogen all over the body. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she uh, her, her read on things, she likes to use higher levels of the estrogen in the blood than I feel comfortable with. And so, you know, we, we have ranges in our groups that we've decided on that, you know, we think move the needle. It's like give enough, but you don't, it's, it's not more isn't always better with most things, right? There's a sweet spot. So it's just give enough of the hormones and you can measure the levels easily. Quest, LabCorp, you know, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. We also measure pregnenolone and DHEA. Those are important brain hormones and huge body of, of research about pregnenolone deficiency and, and what happens with the brain and the cardiovascular system with that. But it's, those two, the DHEA and the pregnenolone, are supplements. So mm-hmm. you don't need a prescription for those. But it doesn't mean that they're harmless and you can just take as much as you want. I never recommend them unless I do a blood test and find out that someone needs it because not everybody needs those things. So I think that's another uh, caveat that I'd like to say about this whole approach that we work with. It really does help to work with a physician that can test everything for you and help you to know what do you need for your body because we don't all need the same things. Mm -hmm. And it is a waste of money and possibly dangerous if you're taking things that you don't need and and could hurt you by having too much. We should probably wrap. I could talk to you for hours, Dr. Toops. You just know so much and thank you. Thank you for for sharing oh, I like I could you. talk for hours. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's I great. I always have so much to say. It's great. So <laughs> if someone is coming into this and thinking, okay, I I know someone with, my, with mild cognitive impair, impairment. I have brain fog myself. Where would you, would you say, find a functional medicine physician right away, try to get to the bottom of all these different things that may be causing this and that it's fixable? They shouldn't just blow it off. Oh, I'll do it next year. I'll do it next year. In the meantime, their cognitive level keeps going down. What 
what you probably want to leave people with is you can do something about this. So jump on it. Of course. Yeah, of course you can. And let me just give you a little story of the importance of that. So I had a patient in my uh, last study. He was a physician, very smart guy, you know, surgical subspecialty inventor, you know, started a company with inventions, you know, great brain. Mm -hmm. Right. And he had gone to his doctor a couple years, was it two, three years before he saw me and said, I'm having problems with my memory. And so they gave a little neuropsych testing battery and they said, you know, most of your scores are not bad, except your verbal memory. And his verbal memory was about in the 19th percentile then, which is not good, right? Mm -hmm. 50% is normal. Mm -hmm. And this guy should be above average mm -hmm. by merit of his educational level and all that he had done. So they said, don't worry about it. Just, you know, eat right, get sleep, take care of yourself. So what did he do? Nothing, right? Mm -hmm. His doctor said, oh, you're okay. It's not that big a deal, right? So he did nothing. And then, you know, two years later, he heard about our study, did all the testing. And of course, he qualified for the study. And at that point, his verbal memory had come down to like the ninth percentile or something. He had, he had lost brown and it was in the toilet. That's in the toilet. <laughs> um, and he was having a lot of trouble, you know, functioning and, you know, he's trying to remember everything in meetings. And um, so, so. Yeah, I think this underscores, you know, the danger of ignoring it and your doctor saying, oh, we all have senior moments. We all have, you know, some change in our brain with aging. And that is not true. And so let me just tell you, this guy finished back up at the 95th or 6th percentile at the end of the study. So he went from, you know, this major problem. And, you know, thank goodness it wasn't too late to take him back up to normal. Um, but but yes, yeah, so I would say don't ignore these things. Um, you know, there's something now in the vernacular called subjective cognitive impairment. And that means when I think I have a problem. And if your spidey sense or your intuition says, gosh, I think I'm having a problem, pay attention to that. And, you know, sometimes there's low hanging fruit that can be easily addressed. Um, but obviously, you know, as I mentioned earlier, foundation of general health, right? You know, eating right, exercising. Exercise is a huge and free thing you can do every day to help your brain. But the two best validated things we, we know to make for neuroplasticity and make new connections in our brain are exercise and meditation. Mm. And you don't need a lot of money to do those things, right? That's something that everyone can do. Um, and, you know, I could go on and on about the specifics, but those those two things are great. And meditation doesn't have to be, you know, sitting in a lotus position. And, you know, I mean, meditation is basically it's mindfulness. Anytime you sort of turn off your brain and come into your body and be present in the moment um, can give you those those benefits. And I tell people, look, go on a go on a walk and leave your cell phone and just be present and, you know, listen to the birds and listen and smell the smells and watch the bees fly by and just be present and shut off all that chatter in your brain. That that's a meditation, um, you know? So, um, so anyway, those are things I think everybody can do work on their basic health, but I am a big believer in testing. And I think it's one of the criticisms leveled at us in functional medicine, though, we test too many things. Well, how can you know until you test it? I find the craziest things by testing. And, you know, many of them are very easy to correct. But if you don't correct them, I mean, you've got to keep your thyroid hormones regulated. We have an epidemic of thyroid disease mm -hmm. these days. The whole Hashimoto's was not even a thing when I went to medical school in the 80s. I don't even remember learning about it then, you know, but now it seems like every third or fourth person that I see has Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune form of, of thyroid disease. So uh, autoimmunity is something that we test for. And I can't tell you how many people have no idea that they're suffering from autoimmune diseases um, or, you know, their T cells aren't working, their immune system isn't working. We've learned We've learned a lot about the immune system because of the effects of COVID on the immune system. Um, but there's many other diseases and viruses that I test for mm -hmm. that, also, that affect the brain and affect the immune system. And, there, and we have protocols and things that we can do to help 
you know, lower the, the load and the, the levels of those infections, both viruses, Lyme disease is a huge thing, um, you know, that uh, I found, you know, quite a few of my patients clearly had had Lyme disease. And then it's trying to determine, is it still a factor for them? Does it need more treatment? Um, because Lyme disease is just like syphilis. Right? It's a spirochete mm -hmm. like in the same class as syphilis. And most people have learned somehow in their childhood that in, you know, the 1800s, a man would get syphilis and, you know, he would get over the STD component of it. But down the road, he would go, go crazy, go mad. That was the, you know, the terminology for dementia back then because it was eating up their brain. So uh, there's an interesting case of a woman who was treated supposedly successfully for Lyme disease and she became demented and died and they autopsied her brain and they found live spirochetes oh, in her brain. Oh, oh. So, you know, that's a, another hidden infection that's heart. You, just if you go and get a test at Quest in Lyme, it's not going to tell you whether you have Lyme disease because they're only testing for one or two strains. And there's many, many strains of Lyme that they don't test for. They also don't test for all the bands. So when they, when they test for Lyme, the first level test, they run an electrophoretic gel and the different proteins migrate in a gel and make bands when they stain them. And there's a number of bands that will indicate reactions to different components of the Lyme organism. And they threw out the ones that were affected by the Lyme vaccine. Now, the Lyme vaccine was many years ago. It was only used briefly because there were problems with it. And so very few people have had that, that vaccine. Mm -hmm. And yet all of the testing at our top two lab companies, LabCorp and Quest, is based on, oh, they might have taken that vaccine, so we won't test them for all these other bands. So we have to use outside specialty companies to do that testing, which unfortunately generally means more costs for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because insurance doesn't always cover the specialty testing. But if you're having cognitive decline, you want to know if you have tick-borne illness. You want to know if you're being exposed to mycotoxins. That's a whole, you know, we could spend a couple hours on, on the effects of mold mm -hmm. and mycotoxins, right? Mm -hmm. But And that's a really hard concept for people to get their head around. Um, but, you know, some of the species of mold are very neurodegenerative. I mean, that you know, the aspergillus can cause even acutely can cause Parkinsonian symptoms. Um, so, you know, you're, if you have mold in your house, uh, mm -hmm. it needs to be tested and you, you can, you know, collect dust in your house and send it in yourself to get a, you know, the first level of uh, reading on it. And because you don't have to have visible mold to have problems with mold in your house. Um, and sometimes people have had floods or leaks and they've been fixed and they don't know it's a problem. Um, historically, we've used a company called Mycometrics mm -hmm. for the home mold testing, and they're a good company. And uh, now in our study, we're using a, a newer company called Liz Biotech. Hmm. It's L-I-S, L-I-S, and then Biotech, all one word. They were started by one of our most trusted mold advisors who's on the board of, of ISEAI, the International Society for environmentally acquired illness. I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with that organization, mm -hmm. but that's our one of our main uh, professional groups that works with environmental illnesses, meaning Lyme, mold, toxins, those kind of things. And so, um, so Larry Schwartz, one of the uh, environmental inspectors and mold inspectors consulted for this company and they're less expensive, which of course helps all of us, you know, because the cost of testing out of pocket can add up. So um, they give nice reports, they come back quickly. And uh, let's see, I think, uh, I think the price is 210 to $240, something okay. in that range. And basically you, you order a, uh, a test called an ERMI, E-R-M-I, mm -hmm. and that's going to test the more strains of mold. They mm -hmm. have a less expensive one, but it doesn't test that many strains. Mm -hmm. And I'll just give you what I've learned to do with that. So they, they send you a Swiffer dust cloth, and um, one of my trusted mold inspector people from ISCAI organization taught me this when he inspected my house, he said, fold it in quarters okay. and you're going to collect dust and you just want to make that one quarter as dusty as possible because when they get it, they're going to vacuum off the dust 
and then they PCR test it to look for the different strains genetically that are there and how many of them. So if the dust is kind of concentrated, it's easier for them to vacuum it off. But um, he says, you, you don't want to collect ancient dust. So, you know, the top of your refrigerator or under your refrigerator, most, most people don't clean regularly there. That dust is called ancient dust. It's going to, it's going to over represent your mold levels. So don't collect that. You, the ideal is to dust your house and wait two weeks and collect fresh dust. Huh. And um, you can dust the walls, like a big swatch of the walls. And, you know, under sinks, around vents. And if you have any mold, like in your bathroom, don't don't go directly through that. Because that will over-represent and overgrow everything as well. But clean around it with the dust. And um, those are, I think, ways to get a good reading on that. Dr. Toops, I just want to thank you so much for being with us today. You are fabulous in what, how you are changing the outlook for people who have some cognitive issues. You've helped us tons. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me and helping to get this word out. Because as you said, I think the biggest thing is for people to realize that, that there's hope, you know, and I, I, you know, I like to leave people with my favorite, you know, saying is, you know, dementia is not a death sentence. You know, historically you get diagnosed, they say, get your affairs in order, mm -hmm. you know, and, this, this is not true. And if you buy into that, then that's the path that you're going to go down. But, you know, it's exciting. We have so many clinical case reports, but now we're getting research data also to, you know, to further validate that. Um, and it's a labor intensive thing to make all these changes and, you know, invest in it. But once people get, you know, get comfortable with doing that, it's not an, you know, other than the cost of whatever supplements you need, mm -hmm. it's not an ongoing expense. You know, if, if you have to go in assisted living around here in the San Francisco area, it's it's well over $100,000 a year yeah. to, you know, so to me, it's like invest in, you know, do what you need to do, but, you know, to understand that there, there really is hope. And the sooner we catch these things, the better. So, you know, keeping up with these things, you know, as you get in, start moving up into your fifties, we're seeing dementia younger and younger because of what's happening in the, the toxins in the world. So don't ignore it and don't let it become a death sentence. Boy, thank you. Thank you. Wise words. You've been listening to the Cutting Edge Health Preventing Cognitive Decline podcast. Any information shared here is for educational purposes only. Guest opinions are their own. This podcast is not responsible for the veracity of their statements. Do not use any of this information without first talking to your doctor. Cutting Edge Health, LLC, is not responsible for what may happen to you if you use their information in place of official advice from a medical professional. Thanks for listening. Be well.